che ti serve quando ti serve. Con Easy Bank, la banca digitale di Intesa San Paolo. Permettete a Cristo di parlare all'uomo. Don Gius aveva capito il problema che avevo. Se la tua vocazione è vero, il tuo lavoro uh, verrà fuori anche dai sassi. Comunicare la fede agli altri, ma veramente insieme a loro riscoprire che cos'è la fede, che cos'è la, la fede per me. Portare Cristo agli altri, comunicarla agli altri, è l'unico modo che, che abbiamo per conoscerlo veramente. aiuta a comunicare all'esterno la ricchezza di vita, di giudizi, di tentativi, di opere che nascono dalle persone e dalle comunità. L'Itre Comunionis è proprio la vita del movimento. Scrivete a Litter Comunionis le vostre esperienze, ci fate bene. Prestare il proprio tempo per il bene comune è un valore prezioso che va sostenuto e tutelato. Da sempre, vicini a enti religiosi e non profit. Contatta subito i nostri agenti. E allora si è voltato improvvisamente alla gente che aveva lì e ha detto «La gente che cosa dice che io sia? Chi dice che io sia?» E voi chi dite che io sia? È bello avere quello che ti serve quando ti serve. Con Easy Bank, la banca digitale di Intesa San Paolo. Permettete a Cristo di parlare all'uomo. Don Gius aveva capito il problema che avevo. Se la tua vocazione è vero, il tuo lavoro uh, verrà fuori anche dai sassi. Comunicare la fede agli altri, ma veramente insieme a loro riscoprire che cos'è la fede, che cos'è la, la fede per me. Portare Cristo agli altri, comunicarla agli altri, è l'unico modo che, che abbiamo per conoscerlo veramente.
L'iter comunionis aiuta a comunicare all'esterno la ricchezza di vita, di giudizi, di tentativi, di opere che nascono dalle persone e dalle comunità. L'Itter Comunionis è proprio la vita del movimento. Scrivete all'Itter Comunionis le vostre esperienze, ci fate bene. Prestare il proprio tempo per il bene comune è un valore prezioso che va sostenuto e tutelato. Da sempre, vicini a enti religiosi e non profit. Contatta subito i nostri agenti. E allora si è voltato improvvisamente alla gente che aveva lì e ha detto la gente che cosa dice che io sia? Chi dice che io sia? E voi chi dite che io sia? civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo.
Welcome to everybody and a warm welcome to Father Adriano Cunha. If we're not after the essence, then what are we after? Already in this months in preparing, preparing for the meeting, this title found a resonance in many people and a consonance almost, it was almost immediate. It's as if this question had woken up a, a chance to breathe again, had opened a horizon in a, well, in a world where every day we're invaded by an infinity of information, also of distractions, pulled into or dragged along with the unexpected changes and violent changes. It's too evident how, the, how necessary it is to find or find again what's essential, an essentiality that lets us live with dignity and, and integrity, a life that doesn't want to succumb to the risk of, a, of, of, an, of, a, of an alienation that wants Red, positive and fertile relationships, an essentiality that sustains us in our being free and responsible. We're very grateful to Father Adrian Candia for having accepted our invitation to share with us his experiences and his reflections on this question, which we've taken from the American author Cormac McCarthy. Those who have been to the meeting in recent years will remember that Father Candia uh, intervened in 2021 in an, in an encounter, a meeting with the title, The Eye and the Faith and the Challenge of Cultures. And last year, in one called The Flattening of the World and the Question of Truth. Two moments in which came out his capacity to face crucial questions from our, of our time with an intelligence that's genuine and, a sensi and an original sensibility. That's ca these characteristics we find in his many publications that, are, that have reached a great international public and which are also have been awarded prestigious prizes. Father Candia was born in Paris. He, in 2006, he entered the Dominican order after a period dedicated to politics. For 12 years, he lives in Cairo. He's a member of the Dominican Institute for Oriental Studies and is the prior of the Dominican convent, uh, Dominican convent in that area. He lives in a place which certainly has favored his particular gift, that of dialoguing in a sincere and fertile way, fruitful way with other religions and cultures. Thank you, Father Candia, for, having, for being with us, and I'll have, hand over to you. Thank you, Bernard, for, for the, that warm welcome. Thank you to all you. In fact, this is the third time that I come to Rimini for the meeting. I know you can't tell that my Italian it hasn't got any better. Maybe year by year, maybe you have. Uh, it's also a bit hard. It's always all because you're you're so indulgent when 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 the, the it's been a bit late at night. But Cairo, where uh, in Cairo, where I live. A young French person, 23 years old, who'd come in Egypt, he came to, he, he was there for, for, to do a voluntary experience, voluntary work for a few months. 
he came to uh, to talk to me about the the aims at the end of his his time there, and he had only a month left. So I asked him, "What did he want to do?" He, he reflected for a moment, and then he said, "To profit, to profit from this. This I want to profit from. It may be." In French, this this word this word, as as maybe has a different uh, different respect to Italian, but in it, in Italian you'd need to say something else to full fully make use of the time at my disposition, something like that. But, but this 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 thing that that we often hear from young people of his generation, almost as a an, a categorical imperative. Like this, like the ultimate secret of wisdom, like the moral, the supreme moral law. It didn't have in in the mouth of this Catholic young man who who generously gave his time. It didn't have a a vulgar or or, or hedonist or egg or selfish um, meaning like Don Giovanni or Petronio. He wanted only to intensely live this last month, go, going right into the depths for the, for the children whom he was teaching. Didn't want to waste a single one of these last precious moments in which he could continue to discover Egypt, warming himself by the affection of the friends he'd met there, delivering f to fully the adventure of his period far from home. There's nothing you can see that's morally condemnable about this. So for this, I'd, I didn't uh, argue with his, his motto, uh, pro to profit I'd, in, in the name of some kind of narrow moralism that oppo opposing the spirit of sacrifice against that of enjoyment would have probably Probably, probably missed what was essential. Profit as much as you want, but of what in deep down? Or more precisely, according to which order of priorities? Because, I say to him, this is exactly what will happen in this, in this last month. If the only motto that you have for this last month is that of not wasting even a second of doing all you making the best use of everything of living only exceptional moments then you'll above all pass your time asking yourself if what you're living is up to the heights of your expectations if you hadn't done better to be elsewhere or with others you'll continue to value, to, comp to compare, to regret. It's a, it's a heavy tyranny, that uh, imperative to a prof profit from something. It's a paradoxical tyranny because it impedes you, really, from simply being there, happily, happy with what you're living. It brings into your heart a, a disquiet, a constant one that ruins what it promises. Being obliged to make the best of everything means fearing always that you might lose something. Uh, all told, it's impossible to profit, to profit from anything if you start out by seeking to profit from it. Maybe that day I managed to express myself with a, with a clarity because he, despite the effort of having to put up with listening to an, an adult who's giving you uh, advice about your life, he listened to me. And that he understood the, the blind alley in which his, his motto would take him. So what to do then? My wisdom actually, is really <clears throat> that of Seneca. For the sailor who doesn't know in which port to arrive, no wind is favorable. 
What did he desire to do with this month? What counts more? What did he want to lose? That he, he could decide and that he, he could live up to it. And everything that the providence would bring him, more than that, would be a gift. A gift to welcome with gratitude. Profiting is great as long as you know what you want. What's important, as long as you have a, an idea that's relatively clear of, about what is essential. <clears throat> I'm not telling you this tale. It's quite common in the life of a priest. If it didn't seem to me a particularly useful fable for, for our modern condition, in which people who, good people, who seek to do good, fear, fear so much to lose their life, to, to lack something, to miss something, to, to drown in this search with your eyes already always attracted by a telephone, which you never switch off. Switch off. Who switched theirs off today? Which you never switch it off, which you keep there as like the promise that, that's always disappointing, we know, but always re renewed of a world that's more interesting that would be revealed to us by one message or by a notification that would justify, we believe, our perpetual vigilance. And what is the moral of this tale? Rather than scatter our attention in an, in an all-out readiness, it would be better to focus on the essential. A wise, a wise conclusion, but perhaps, but one that doesn't take us far. Because, after all, nothing is more consensual than an invitation to prefer the essential to what's an, an accessory. Who could say otherwise? Those original types who wish to defend th the superficial, the futile, they, w they wouldn't fail to conclude that what everybody considers insignificant frivolity is actually fundamental. And in the, in the end, it's always the essential that prevails. Everyone agrees that in the saying that the essential is essential. But of course, naturally, it is much more difficult to agree on the nature of this essential. And this is where, at this point, that the problems begin. Not necessarily here in Rimini, a Christian association, communion and liberation, invites a friar, a preaching, a preacher to speak. You wouldn't be either shocked or surprised if I told you that the main thing that we have to focus on is Jesus Christ, that the essential is Jesus Christ. Although, naturally, it's not only ca believers or Catholics here at, at our meeting. This is, in fact, what's interesting about the meeting. No one would be here would be shocked, would be would be scandalized to hear some somebody say this kind of thing. At most, you might be a little bit disappointed to not have learnt something new, and especially, above all, not to have acquired something that you could share, something shareable, when you get back home, because you know very well that once the meeting is over, when everybody's gone home with their head full of nice memories and of new ideas, after an exciting encounters, you'll have to go back to our world where, as we know, there isn't much consensus on what should be considered essential. 
This is certainly what characterizes modern societies. We do not agree on what is essential, on what is essential. And this isn't entirely new. It's already what Max Weber had described a century ago when he was speaking of a polytheism of values. The sociologist saw German society in 1919 as, as being traversed by different systems of values between which it seemed impossible to choose using a scientific method to, to choose with, with certainty. French civilization, is it better or worse than German culture? Maybe I have a particular opinion about this, about this question, and I'll let you guess which one. But Weber was right. It's mine is only an opinion, not a scientific truth. And he, no, Weber notes, he goes even further. Some of his contemporaries see in the non-violence preached in the Sermon on the Mount, with its invitation to turn the other cheek, they see the insurmountable horizon of ethics, while others, who are readers of Nietzsche, for example, understand very differently the dignity of a virile being, and they very much prefer to respond blow for blow. Everyone must, he goes on Weber, must choose between these two irreconcilable ethics. The one which will have the face of the devil and the other that of God. It wouldn't be difficult to, as you know, to, to come up with many examples showing that the situation described by Weber has only strengthened a century later. So, for example, should we, in the name of an ethic of compassion and rejection of suffering, should we propose death to those who suffer? Or should we instead oppose with all our might an exception for euthanasia that would soon could push the weak, the poor, the disabled, push these to death, all those who are quickly considered to be a burden on society. The, in this strong, this debate that cu cuts across our society, you could obviously have a strong opinion, a very specific opinion, very clear. But we couldn't believe that this opinion on, a, on an issue as fundamental as life and death, that this would be shared by everyone, even those in our immediate entourage. And so we find ourselves in interminable debates, interminable because they are so undecidable. If we don't agree on what is essential, then our, unfortunately our arguments, our reasonings often have no, no grip, no effect on those who don't share their assumptions. This is what Weber calls the war of the gods, the clash in society between irreducible complexion, conceptions, not only on certain details, but on what should be considered essential. We are not only the heirs of the diagnosis of Weber, but also of his solution to avoid the violence of the war of the gods, the breakdown of societies whose members no longer agree 
and what is essential. He recommended that we distinguish facts from values. The former, the facts, are the object of science, while the others, the second one, fall within the, the realm of freedom of choice. Maybe we have even a bit radicalized this solution, this solution of his. If for him, the discussion of what is essential or less, if that had to disappear from the scientific debate, because the solution couldn't be a scientific one, we maybe tend to make it disappear from the debate full stop. To preserve civil peace, we could, we could together in a society, we could do commerce, we could trade with each other, we could do business, we could go to the cinema, talk about football or the, about the weather, but not discuss the essential, not start debating on what we should consider essential. Or more precisely, we can talk about it all we want, as long as we don't seek to, to be right, to consider our essential more true, or more essential, uh, th more true, or more essential than that of our neighbor. In other words, the polytheism of values was, in the Weber's time, a matter of fact between systems that were struggling to prevail over the others. It has become, in our pluralist democracies, a matter no longer of fact, but of war. Because no system of values, however ambitious, could ever prevail and impose itself on the freedom of choice of each one. In questa situazione, in this situation, like ours, what could a Christian attitude be? We certainly cannot be content knowing that we are the bearers of a universal salvation that, uh, that everyone has access to. To see the gospel, surely we cannot be content to see the gospel reduced to a series of particular proposals that, that do not address everyone, that aren't relevant. I believe the essential movement of the pontificate of Benedict XVI can be understood as an effort to recreate the universal, to reaffirm the possibility of a common good for discussion among all men. The ground of rationality to explain the reasons of faith and to somehow put the discussion on the essence, on the essential, back at the center of the debate. It's a truly admirable effort, which must certainly be continued and amplified, but without deluding ourselves. And a, uh, the meeting helps us engage in this. As I said, we must continue without deluding ourselves. The pluralism of our societies is from the human point of view, insurmountable. And it is this society, not another, that we would have transformed by reintegrating the universal. And this universal is what we must evangelize. And it's not that easy evangelizing a pluralist society. one soon ends up adapting and accepting the rules of a uh, competitive operation. Just as Pepsi and Coca-Cola share the market, obviously not without a, a, a fierce struggle between them, we should aim to gain a, you could call it a market share or at least to not lose too much of it, in the face of our competitors, Islam, 
Pentecostalism, atheism, but also, and perhaps overall, indifference and widespread materialism. It's a temptation for Christians to consider themselves in this world one camp among others, obviously the best side, but just one of the many sides, trying to gather and bring together as many souls as possible for their own cause, anxiously watching the number of conversions and of those who leave the faith. It is a temptation to dive headlong into this great market where everyone proposes to a bewildering crowd his own idea of what is essential, trying to speak louder than the others, to attract attention in the midst of proposals that are as numerous on the, this market as brands of pasta offered by supermarkets are. Sell me the idea of Jesus, a girl said to me in a, in a bar in France one evening. A young girl, was a, a, she was a, she'd been attracted, drawn in by my, my religious habit, which is a, considered far more exotic in France than it is in Italy. This girl was probably, when she asked me this question, she was probably quite curious to know if I would be able, in a few minutes, to offer her a, a more convincing explanation than a type of, you know, any personal growth book she'd ever read. I had to answer her that although Jesus washes us from sin, I didn't have any detergent to sell her. So the proclamation of the gospel in this way is no longer about the gospel because we well know that such a conception is imbued with the spirit of the world, where it is less and less about serving and following the truth and more about dominating others. One easily, a Dominican said, it's, easily to, it's easy to confuse love of truth with a passion to be right especially, perhaps, when one is uh, the heir to a church that for a long time held in the West a kind of monopoly on the definition of what was essential. Not to mention that this past soon runs the risk of mis mixing with our zeal the uh, sad passions of regret and nostalgia. This uh, competitive way is not the way of the gospel. Nor, in my opinion, and probably not by accident, nor is it the path proposed by uh, Father Giussani. I speak of it with uh, the highest caution because there are here quite literally thousands of people who are much better to much better qualified than I am to explain his uh, his thought and his philosophy you know I, I don't know much about Giussani but in my ignorance I nevertheless seem to have understood that his entire commitment to the education of young people in particular through the uh, percorso which I'm sure you uh, know far better than I do, all his effort was aimed at proposing faith as an adventure and not as a, a closure of thought, as something academic. In other words, he did not consider the, the essence the, uh, to which our faith gives us access as a, uh, a definite final conclusion such a definite closed answer that it could be presented and sold to contemporaries. Mike is much like one might sell a you know, washing detergent. Rather, he paints it as the object, as the, uh, the aim of a quest, of an adventure. 
This is why he mentions there's a, he writes of there being an educational risk with definitive conclusions that must be repeated and passed on. When it is, if everything is definite, there is no risk. But if everything is, if all conclusions are definite, there's probably no education either, at least not education in faith. Because faith is not the, the start point and therefore the end of any search, as, you know, as if this search can only bring us towards conversion. And, you know, now I've converted, I don't search for faith anymore. It's, it's rather on the contrary. Faith is the beginning. It's a c principle of continuous search without which it's nothing more than idolatry, even if, granted, it's the idolatry of a, uh, a true God. It's idolatry nonetheless. This is why I'm not surprised that a, a quote from a novel by Cormac McCarthy as, a, as Bernard mentioned earlier I'm, I'm not surprised you know Bernard has organized all of this you can and you can see the uh, this phrase everywhere plastered everywhere the quote that if we are not seeking the essence then what are we after I'm not surprised because at the heart of this question is not that famous essence itself but rather the search for the essence and that changes everything claiming to possess the essential is not the same thing as as seeking it a church that sees its mission as a duty to help people to see to teach them to teach everyone to seek the essence wherever it may be found a church like this is, is not the same thing as a church that simply demands adherence. Accepting that faith is not the possession of the essential, but rather the beginning of its search, is certainly the most effective antidote against our temptations of idolatry or that is the temptations of an appropriation of God against the risk of living according to the, uh, the spirit of the world with its unbridled sense of competition. Having said this, to present faith as a quest doesn't mean eulogizing doubt and certainly not a permanent doubt doubt exists very much so it's a fact and there are souls who are truly tormented by it who are obsessed by it who never find peace while others other souls are, are, are barely touched by it it's above all a, a question of character not of virtue it would be a mistake to attribute a moral value one way or the other to this doubt here however it's not a question of, of, of praising doubt seeking the essential when one is a believer does not mean subjecting oneself endlessly to the uh, excruciating doubt about God his existence, his church, his goodness but rather being a believer means that we have never reached the end of our search that we never possess God, who is infinite, and that for eternity we will always be in, in the process of discovering God, always at the beginning of our journey, having glimpsed only the surface of a God who is always greater and more beautiful than we believed. So, you know, as far as, you know, since we've got all eternity, that's all very well and we'll have plenty of time to get used to it. But today, what does it concretely mean to live in the search of the essence? You know, we've understood you, you don't have to try and possess the, uh, the essence, but to, to search for it. So, well, beyond all these, these lovely words we've said, what does this mean? 
And I believe there's a very concrete answer to this question. But in order to get to the answer, I ask you to uh, bear with me and follow me on a little uh, diversion into uh, something a bit more abstract. I know it's the afternoon, I know it's hot, but uh, trust me, it won't be too long, too complicated. And besides, it's not my fault. It's, it's the fault of the American writer Cormac McCarthy, author of the novel from which the title of our meeting is taken. And, you know, it, it's been, it's, the title was taken more or less from this book, because uh, if, you, if you ever bother to, uh, to read the novel, you'll discover that it doesn't exactly contain our title. What you'll see is that at the end of the book, if we are not searching for the essence, writes McCarthy, then what are we searching for? We talk about essence, not essentials. Probably the organisers who never, uh, the organisers of the meeting, who never, they, they never claimed that the quote was taken word for word from McCarthy, they probably, the organisers probably felt it would be more meaningful for many of us with the, with the, the, the Italian translation to, uh, to, to write it the way they did to make it a bit more broader and a bit more meaningful. Searching for the, the essence of things, for what stands at the core of everything, is a bit more nebulous. Certainly more nebulous than searching for what is essential, despite the, uh, the common root of the two words. So what do we mean exactly by essence? Without going into a, uh, an exegesis of this novel, which is it's a rather enigmatic one, it seems that for McCarthy, the essence in the context of the book should be understood in a philosophical sense. The essence which, uh, for Aristotle, is the cause or principle that makes a thing what it is. Seeking the, the essence of all things is what I would call a uh, metaphysical inquiry par excellence. One that inquires you know, beyond phenomena into the surface of all things. It dives deeper than just the surface level into what things really are. And I, I see what you're, what, you're, what you're saying, what you're thinking. Here's just another Dominican who, who, who cannot help himself but to trace everything back to uh, Aristotle and the scholasticism of St. Thomas. You may well be thinking, he promised us something concrete, and now we find ourselves distinguishing between essence, substance, accident. Don't worry. Don't worry. This isn't uh, the scholastic direction I intend to take you down. Because to, to seek the essence of things like this is quite an, ex an exciting project for a, a metaphysician but I, I, I don't really want to make it my own. If seeking the essence of things means enclosing them in a uh, tight knot of ever more precise definitions, I fear that it would obscure a reality which, on the contrary to this, always turns out to be surprising or unexpected. It's always that which we do not understand that's most interesting. You know, I say that so that if you don't understand, you can, if you don't understand what I'm saying, you can, you can just say that it's more interesting because of it. You know, I see that a lot of you haven't understood what I'm saying, so, you know, it just makes it all the more interesting. Obviously, reason is, is useful, obviously, but it only comes afterwards comes after the, uh, the event, after the uh, encounter that detonated all our, all our predictions, all of our predefined uh, categories, our worldview. You know, metaphysicians are useful, yeah, I'm not saying otherwise, but the one who comes back afterwards to put things in all the right places, with the, the right labels on all of them, he is 
useful, you know, it's useful much like an archivist is, someone who, who, who sorts and classifies things. And Napoleon had his own archivists who uh, made him more understandable to us today. But Napoleon himself was not an archivist. He made history, not classifications. I always fear when we get into, you know, when one gets in interested in classifications and definitions, that we may end up passing by, passing over the essential, you know, the es uh, essence, this essential, which sometimes goes beyond our, our, our mental predefinitions. So, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure that seeking essences as a metaphys metaphysician does is a truly Christian project. Unless we understand that this search for the essence, unless we understand it in a radically different way, it's no longer a question of enclosing what's real in predefined rational definitions, but of taking seriously the account of creation, which in the Bible is obviously not intended to compete with uh, astrophysics in describing events but rather the Bible is meant to reveal to us what meaning God himself gives to each of his works at the heart of the story of creation that we all know very well is that refrain which returns day after day when uh, when God contemplates what he has created, God saw that it was good. It's a refrain that returns, however, with a variation on the sixth day when God created man in his own image and his own likeness. It says, God saw what he had made, and behold, it was a very great thing. If things, and especially beings, have an essence that we must seek, it cannot be a conceptual and abstract definition, but that fundamental goodness that is its deepest truth. To search for the essence means to commit oneself to saying, to everything, and especially to every person, it's good that you exist. Saying for it, and uh, to say it, but above all, to think it, to adopt on the world the very gaze of the Creator Himself, who can see in everything a reflection of His goodness. He who looks at wasps and mosquitoes and knows how to say, it's beautiful that you exist. Who looks at every human being and says, behold, it's very beautiful. To perceive the essence of things and of beings means knowing how to look at them with this look of, of recognition, of joy, of blessing. It is beautiful, it is very beautiful that you exist. This essence must be searched for. Sometimes it's not, not at all evident. And to be honest, I distrust of it those who say that it jumps out in front of their eyes, that it's clear that everything's good. Those who see in the world good without any effort, usually they aren't looking. They're dreaming it, they're imagining it, because it's, it's more comfortable this way. However, it's, we're not talking about going through life with a constant smile. Oh, everything's nice. Oh, <clears throat> oh with like an optimist in front of, with an, with an ironclad optimism. This, must, this need to seek what's good, the goodness of things, of, of, of beings, must be 
must be looked at without naivety, without, without superficiality, without denying a priori the existence of evil or the, or the existence of the wicked. One doesn't say it's good that you exist only to a child who's playing innocently in the sunshine, laughing and smiling. You say it also to someone who's just cut us up on the road. And I who live in Cairo, I admit that sometimes I struggle to see the goodness of man when I'm driving the car. I think my, my bishop is here and he'll understand what I have in mind. And you say it also to a, a murderer, to a war criminal, but you don't do it out of indulgence, minimizing the evil that was committed. But no, oh, it doesn't matter. No, he didn't want to be bad. No, no, he's, he's not bad really. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes, yeah, he did want to do it. Sometimes, yeah, he's, he's, he's bad, certainly. But that is not his essence. That is not the essential. Even if it maybe takes, a, sometimes might take a whole lifetime a lifetime of searching and effort to find it, to, f to find this essential. Sometimes it is quite well hidden. Because if every man is in the image of God, then sin, that the fathers of the church tell us, has made him lose this likeness. And the Christian, the Christian life consists not only in the effort to find, through the virtues, the sacraments, spiritual life, our own likeness to God, but also to search for it passionately, searching for it in others. And until we've, not, until we've seen the goodness of beings, It means that we haven't yet finished seeking for them. Uh, as long as we've not found a reflection of the beauty of God in them, it means that our search must continue. This program of life has nothing s sentimental or sappy about it. It is of, a, of an incredible requirement a critical need that that mystical the one of the mystic to let uh, that every encounter can be from it can be born an epiphany a manifestation of god this is the true contemplation true christian contemplation to try with more or less sophisticated methods to lose oneself in the one or in the all there's nothing evangelical about it to seek in every person the presence of God, that's maybe well hidden, the presence of God. This is instead what Jesus does from the morning to night. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God, he promises us. But where will they see him? Where will they see God if not in the face of their neighbor? on condition that it's true, that they have a heart that's sufficiently pure to not see in that face a rivalry, a threat, a challenge, but rather an opinion, opportunity to meet the living God. It's often said that the neighbor is the test of our spiritual life. I think I'm a very very advanced in the spiritual life, having reached heights where maybe I brush against Teresa of Avila. And the, the, my neighbor turns up the music a bit and I get angry. And so it's, it's true that this, this test is important, but it's also true, this is true really because the neighbor is also the place where all spiritual life, all Christian spiritual life, must take its root. A place that's sometimes arid and difficult, but necessary if I want to take seriously the search for the essence. 
the search for the essential. And like any program of spiritual life, the, this too is not only individual or personal. In, in a, we need to search for the, this meaning in our little, little daily life. This is also the motto of our Chris, common Christian life. It's the program itself of the life and the mission of the church. To bless, bene, to, that is to say good, bene dire, without ulterior motives. How many times do we say, unfortunately? Actually, it, it's not good that you exist. It's not good that you are. But whatever, I, I, I can get over it. Sometimes you hear behind the protestations of universal benevolence so many mental reservations that sound like regrets. It would, uh, well, it would be simpler anyway. You hear it in these silences. If the, there were no homosexuals or if there were no Muslims, in short, it would be better if you weren't, something like that, that makes inaudible our attempts to proclaim the gospel. You can then discuss, obviously, discuss about sexual morality or debate the religious truth as much as you want, and you will certainly be right to do so if, and only if, you've started from the beginning to say, and not only to say, but to truly think that for every human being, it is good that you exist. For to say it is, auth is authentically to transmit and to announce the good news. Every mystic, every mysticism proposes a certain asceticism, and this too is no exception. It's the ascesis of the essential, which involves not getting lost, not losing ourselves in the secondary. Nothing's easier today, but maybe this was already true yesterday, than being caught up in all the polemics of the superficial media. And sometimes, with the, even with the best intentions in the world, for example, the preoccupation to offer a, a Christian point of view, on these questions. But it's always useful. Is it always useful for the kingdom of God? My, however relative it is, but my, my, my notoriety leads me to ask myself this question, even this, this morning. It's, what if some journalist wants to ask you about a question about something that's got nothing to do with the meeting? Well, or like everybody, I have my opinions which are very good, obviously, and are about many things. And m most of the time, it's an opinion that I try to base on my Christian faith. And I'm always, always flattered when a journalist asks me to develop them, my opinions. Or sometimes, even without the question, when I want to share them on social media. But is this really an announcement of the good news? Or is it not rather a distraction, a waste of time for me and for others in the search for the essential? A lack in the ascesis of the essential. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be given to you in addition. The mission of Christians is first to say, to announce the essential, and then to teach it, not to, not with this, capa to this capacity of seeing what's good, to teach it not as a knowledge, a, f a fundamental knowledge, a chapter in a book that needs, we need to learn by heart, but as a, as a know-how, as how to do it to learn to look at the world, to look at men and women, and to see in them what is essential. 
like all know-how, it can only be passed on by, by practicing it ourselves with patience and humility. It's a task that's at once very simple and truly extraordinary, which we can practice anywhere and first and foremost in our pluralist societies to see and make people see them in every man the manifestation of God is not to play the worldly game of competition that I was describing earlier but to transform the world modestly but effectively one heart to change from the world one heart at a time I said at the beginning, this, this means I, I'm nearly finishing. I said at the beginning, and it's the third time that I have the joy of coming to the, Rim, to, to the Rimini meeting. The third time you've done me the honor of inviting me. Uh, I know I'm far from being truly familiar with all the riches that this event offers, but I'm beginning to understand something. I realized, first of all, what it's not. I've realized that it's not what, what, what the journalists uh, say who, who, just have, who just care when the politicians arrive. It's not certainly. But more importantly, I've understood that it's not, and this is what I, perhaps I feared more when I came the first time, I've understood that it, the meeting is not a fortress, a stronghold, where Christians meet up who all believe the same thing, only to leave reinvigorated to assault the world, to, full of energy, to conquer and dominate it. It's not a reunion, a meeting of marketers looking for the, for the best way to sell their God to the rest of the world. On the contrary, in the diversity of its guests and of its proposals, I believe that this meeting seeks to take, to take the risk on itself of understanding of looking at the world as it really is, with its contradictions, its struggles, its failures, with its blind spots, to try and look at it, uh, nevertheless, as God sees it, as, as a wonder that may be wounded, but still a wonder, where God reveals himself and makes himself seen. Perhaps this is why that I always come back with joy. Maybe this is why you also come here. Because, after all, if we are not seeking, if, if I and you are not seeking the essential, then what are we seeking? Stay here. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you, Father. It seems that the applause says that you have touched the hearts and you've helped us to look at the world to look at ourselves as well, and you've comforted m m us greatly with your words. In fact, we are in search of the essential, or exactly in the way you said, 
to look at it, to search for it every day in the, in the marvels of a world that's also very wounded. And to have companions like you in this, in this, in this search helps us a lot. Thank you so much. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. serve quando ti serve. Con Easy Bank, la banca digitale di Intesa San Paolo. Permettete a Cristo di parlare all'uomo. Don Gius aveva capito il problema che avevo. Se la tua vocazione è vero, il tuo lavoro uh, verrà fuori anche dai sassi. la fede agli altri, ma veramente insieme a loro riscoprire che cos'è la fede, che cos'è la, la fede per me, portare Cristo agli altri, comunicare agli altri, è l'unico modo che, che abbiamo per conoscerlo veramente. a comunicare all'esterno la ricchezza di vita, di giudizi, di tentativi, di opere che nascono dalle persone e dalle comunità. L'Itter Comunionis è proprio la vita del movimento. Scrivete a Litter Comunionis le vostre esperienze, ci fate bene. improvvisamente la gente che va lì ha detto la gente che cosa dice che io sia chi dice che io sia e voi chi dite che io sia è bello 
avere quello che ti serve quando ti serve. Con Easy Bank, la banca digitale di Intesa San Paolo. fiducia. Permettete a Cristo di parlare all'uomo. Don Gius aveva capito il problema che avevo. Se la tua vocazione è vero, il tuo lavoro uh, verrà fuori anche dai sassi. Comunicare la fede agli altri, ma veramente insieme a loro riscoprire che cos'è la fede, che cos'è la, la fede per me, portare Cristo agli altri, comunicarla agli altri, è l'unico modo che, che abbiamo per conoscerlo veramente. L'iter comunionis aiuta a comunicare all'esterno la ricchezza di vita, di giudizi, di tentativi, di opere che nascono dalle persone e dalle comunità. L'iter comunionis è proprio la vita del movimento. Scrivete all'iter comunionis le vostre esperienze, ci fate bene. Prestare il proprio tempo per il bene comune è un valore prezioso che va sostenuto e tutelato. Da sempre, vicini a enti religiosi e non profit. Contatta subito i nostri agenti. E allora si è voltato improvvisamente alla gente che aveva lì e ha detto «La gente che cosa dice che io sia? Chi dice che io sia?» 